We are the research group for civic engagement and voter turnout. Um, we're specifically concerned with civic engagement and youth who will be able to vote during the 2016 election. I'm Michael Wayne. Adrian Lowe. Samantha De La Fuente. Camarines Vivar. Um, there are several reasons why we're looking at youth. There has been a consistently significant gap between youth and the overall population in terms of voting rates. And at the same time, youth are interested less in traditional electoral politics and more in alternative forms of politics. Each of us will present an individual topic of study to contribute to our overall understanding of youth civic engagement. Um, I will focus on the, the factors that determine participation behavior in youth. Adrian will look at community level organizations and how they can promote youth participation. Samantha will look at how this can be done in public schools. And Tamaris will look at how this can be done online through digital engagement. We used our initial research to develop questions for a focus group study. The study took place at 32nd Street School, uh, right across the street, a high school in Los Angeles. Um, there were 21 students out of the 45 who responded to our pre-survey who participated in the actual focus group. They were 16 years old. Most of them were 16 years old, but ages ranged from 14 to 17. They were all in either 10th or 11th grade. We chose this school for reasons of convenience, and we recognize the limitations of its sample and its representativeness. Nonetheless, we believe that the findings supplement our research. They help to form the basis of our policy recommendations for the Naleo Educational Fund as it addresses the problem of youth civic engagement. Let's begin by looking at the factors that determine participation behavior in youth. Borrowing from a study on civic volunteering, I propose that these factors can be summed up in three categories. Resources, engagement, and recruitment. The ability, desire, and invitation to participate. First, resources. Um, there are certain social divisions that create an unequal distribution of participation opportunities. Age is the most important for our research. We are looking at youth because they differ from the general population. Youth cannot vote until they are age 18. And even after that, they often don't see themselves as having a big stake in society. Education is another important factor. And um, the research shows that education, a person's education level is actually the biggest predictor of the rate of participation. Unfortunately, there are education-based gaps within those forms of participation that are most popular. There are many other factors in a student's environment that determine their participation behaviors. Here's a graph of some findings from our focus group, pre-survey. We can use this graph to largely determine whether a student's Plans to, plans to register to vote or not, based on whether their parents are registered to vote. 87% of students whose parents are registered to vote plan to do so themselves, compared to 55% whose parents are not registered to vote. Areas for further research could be whether these self-reported intentions translate into actual behavior later on. And if they do, then whether it's possible to change these intentions at an earlier age um, before they reach voting. The second category of factors is engagement, which I define as the predisposition to participate or the desire to participate. And the dimensions of engagement are interest, knowledge, and advocacy. Youth have a declining interest in traditional politics. They don't see voting as a duty. Instead, they prefer a politics that is local, based on relevant issues, and emphasizes the relational aspects of society, helping others. Political knowledge is knowledge of political issues, candidates, processes, and current events. The research shows that political knowledge is positively associated with whether youth will vote. This suggests the importance of, uh, of public education and, and civics education in particular for promoting youth participation. For efficacy, I focus on one concept in particular, internal efficacy. Internal efficacy is a person's feeling that they are politically capable and influential. Their expectations of whether they can make a difference in a particular form of participation uh, influence whether they will try that particular form of participation later. Uh, though this only applies for non-voting forms. Programs that are structured for youth to succeed through simple acts of volunteering, for example, increase their desire to participate, but they often do so at the effect of not at, at the cost of not affecting real change. And a study showed that the programs that send youth out to address root social problems um, tend to lessen their desire to participate more because youth encounter real world obstacles. So there seems to be a trade off between motivating youth to participate and teaching them how to navigate real world obstacles. 
My proposal for the Millennial Educational Fund will be to advocate a strategy that combines structured success with lessons in practicality. The third category of factors that influence youth is recruitment, which refers to whether youth are asked to participate. Research shows that often youth must be presented with a personalized request and ask to trigger their participation behavior. Community level organizations are a promising source of structure because they offer an opportunity and a formal invitation to, ask, uh, to participate. So to recap, we can see that the obstacles, we can see that the factors that determine youth participation present many obstacles um, for an LA, but they also prevent, present opportunities. Recognizing what youth are interested in, increasing their knowledge through public education, structuring their success within programs, and personally inviting them to participate are all promising ways of encouraging youth. Now I'll turn it over to Adrian, who will discuss the prospects of community-level organizations, what is working, which organizations are succeeding, and what role the Nellio Educational Fund might be in. Now that we've heard about the factors that influence participation for Michael, we're going to explore how programs build on these influences to actually further engagement. We're going to start with the elements and importance of these successful programs, then look at um, two successful programs, transition to our focus group findings, and then ultimately conclude with some recommendations for the Naleo Educational Fund and how what their role can be in both promoting these programs and also strengthening the existing ones through their resources and expertise. So what makes a successful program? There is a vast array of opportunities out there currently, but certain programs share three main elements. Kirk Astroff is a youth specialist for 4-H and he identified three elements the first being avoiding hierarchies, as this makes youth feel that they really don't have a strong say in the matter and can't contribute. The next is having a mentorship opportunity. This can be anything from an older peer to an adult that serves as a liaison into the often daunting political process. And lastly, meaningful work instead of busy work with stuffing envelopes. If they get the chance to really contribute, they feel like the system wants their participation. It's not neglecting them. Interestingly enough, it's through these opportunities that youth are mainly exposed to the process at this pre-voting age in which they haven't voted yet or been reached out to. A team at Stanford found that it's their perception of their community's effectiveness in politics that actually is the single most important factor for youth engagement. We're going to look at two sample programs. We have scored a whole host of programs nationwide but decided to pick these two for two reasons. The first was geography. We picked two in which Naleo in areas in which Nileo has offices, and the second is their distinct approaches. One is more traditional and formal, and the other is more grassroots in nature. So the first one we're starting with is YMCA, specifically their model legislature and court program. Now statewide, this serves 2,500 students, and 1,000 of them from here in LA through their um, Metro LA branch. It's a nine-month, very hands-on program that has everything from simulating elections to role-playing government positions. And if you look at the chart on the right, the results are pretty impressive. 97% of their participants go on to vote, as opposed to the just 45% of the general youth vote. Now the second organization is Sisters and Brothers United, which is based in the Northwest Bronx of New York. Now this is a lot more grassroots and hands-on experience. And in addition to traditional training, like setting agendas and how to run meetings, their participants develop a very fierce tie to their communities and even advocate for issues, not just straight politics, but also social issues like educational justice and jobs. And it's because of this that they trust politics and have learn how to use it effectively and desire to use the system to improve their communities, not just for themselves, but also their future generations. Now what further research could look at is if it's more the skills and leadership training versus just the exposure to the system that really drives this increased engagement. Now we're going to look at our survey and focus group findings and talk about how youth's current involvement and the opportunities that are out there. So less than 30% of them were found to be involved in what researchers have termed as politically salient activities or those with a very direct civic and political inclination. But despite these low numbers, what's really promising is that the youth that we talked to said that they wish their, wish their involvement impacted not just their schools, but their communities as well. Um, they also desired, they wished that they had a forum in which they could talk and generate solutions because they felt in their current spheres of dialogue they weren't being taken seriously, they weren't even asked about their opinion. 
Um, what we found really interesting though is when we asked them what brings them to organizations, they identified peer involvement and teacher recruitment, and this is what we're going to explore a little bit further. A team of researchers from Rutgers and George Mason found that youth today are getting fewer invitations to participate in organized efforts than older generations. And while having a peer in an organization brings a good appeal, teachers are actually the single most important um, promoter of these programs and are the ones that need to be giving the invitations. Many programs actually have an established relationship with school districts and teachers to actively bring students into the organizations rather than just let them hear word of mouth. A lot of programs, such as a program called Meet the Challenge in Chicago, actually said that the vast majority of their participants come from teachers, not many stumble across it on their own. Nevertheless, the focus group students that we talked to said they hadn't even been told about opportunities in the area, let alone asked to join them. Thus, our recommendations for the Naleo Educational Fund will look at how they can assist in, in ongoing promotional efforts and also help enhance existing programs through their expertise and resources. So now we're going to turn it over to Samantha, who is going to look at how schools and teachers can help in a curriculum perspective versus a recruitment role. Thank you, Adrian. So as she mentioned, teachers and schools play a crucial role in promoting civic engagement in high school youth. For this, for this reason, my, my research focused on how schools can promote civic engagement among youth. The first portion of my research will deal with the federal government's role in promoting civic awareness among, in schools. Then my attention will be turned to the data from our pre-survey and our focus group, which we conducted at a school nearby, 32nd Street School. Lastly, my policy recommendations to the Naleo Educational Fund will assess how this organization can partner with school board members and state and national elected officials to make changes to civics classes, student body government, as well as create legislation regarding pre-registration for voters. The role the federal government plays in promoting civic engagement is to assess and to guide students' awareness of this topic. This is done mainly through the Department of Education. As some of you may know, the Department of Education in 2013 had a $68 billion discretionary budget. Most of this money is spent on research and policy making. One influential program that the Department of Education leads is the National Assessment of Educational Progress. This program is the only nationally representative and continuing assessment of what American students know and can do in major academic subjects. This includes civics. The findings are detailed in the Nation's Report Card. The 2010 data from the Nation's Report Card was compiled by asking almost 10,000 American <coughs> students questions about civics. Although our research focuses generally on youth, we believe that utilizing data from high school students is relevant because this youth, this group of youth will be the next cycle of voters and their awareness of the democratic process is crucial. The data from the 2010 Nations Report Card found that 97% of 12th grade students reported studying civics or government in school. However, compared to 2006, 12th grade student civics knowledge actually declined. But I'm happy to note that the gap in civics knowledge between Hispanics and white students actually narrowed by a few points. The Nation's Report Card provides just an overview of the research that is being conducted by the federal government. Due to its national scope and its large impact, this assessment of student uh, awareness is a crucial tool to learn about what we can improve on in terms of civic participation among youth. Now I'm going to transition into the findings from our focus group at 32nd Street School. The data I present will be mainly about the student body government, an aspect of school that studies have shown can promote engagement among students. Additionally, from our focus group, we found that there was a high lack of awareness about the voter registration process, and this topic will be covered in detail as well. From our pre-survey data, we found that 84% of students voted in their student body elections. As well, 20% of these students held official positions in their student body government. Now, there were really high rates of participation in this school, but most of the students expressed frustration and dissatisfaction with not being able to make changes in their school with this program. One of the main things that the students talked about was not allowing juniors to get permission to go visit college campuses. 
this was a main issue to, this was an important issue to them that they tried to solve through their student body government. However, the students found that they were not able to make changes through their student body government due to their school's strict rules. A 2013 report from Circle noted that opportunities for engagement at schools are crucial for future involvement in the democratic process. Because the student body government can represent a student's initial perception of engagement, it is crucial that this experience be a positive one. One way to make this happen is to ensure that students have the opportunities to create change within their schools so they do not become discouraged about the participation process in the future. Another salient point that we found was that students were actually really interested in registering to vote, yet many were unaware about how to go about the beginning of the process. Our pre-survey data shows that 70% of students said that they planned to register to vote when they were 18 years old. However, when we spoke to students in our focus group about the process of registration, they really didn't know much about it. Many studies have proposed that one way to solve this is to teach students about voter registration during school, particularly in their civics classes when they're learning about the importance of engagement in the democratic process. Overall, our findings highlight how existing structures in the classroom which are meant to promote civic engagement for students are actually not being utilized to their full potential. My policy recommendations to the, to the Naleo Educational Fund will take advantage of Naleo's unique relationship with school board members and nationally elected officials. Specifically, Naleo can promote awareness of civic engagement among youth in two ways. First, future research in this area should investigate the ways in which the student body government can be made a positive experience for students. And secondly, Naleo can assess how, how aware students are of the voter registration process. If students are mostly unaware about how to register to vote, then Naleo can address this issue through changes to civics courses and maybe legislation for pre-registration for minors. Now that I've highlighted my findings, we're going to turn it over to Dama Reese, who's going to talk about digital civic engagement, an area where we think students can take the, their involvement from school and then now transition it into digital civic engagement. Thank you, Samantha. So we've spoken about um, what determines participatory behavior among, among youth and what the government and community organizations have done to engage this uh, set of students. What I'm going to focus on is digital engagement, why it, is, why, it's important, why it is important, where are teens going, what's attracting their attention, what is not, and how Naleo can use this to further engage uh, youth. <laughs> so what's digital engagement? Broadly, broadly defined, digital engagement involves forms of using the internet, such as social media, to become involved in civics. Examples of this would be posting, uh, joining a political group, uh, friending a candidate or, an or a, a political association, or posting content related to a political or so social issue. So why is this important? This is important because uh, a majority of students and youth are, are flocking the internet. According to a 2010 study of 8 to 18 year olds conducted by the Kaiser Family Foundation, 93% of teens uh, have a computer or access to one at home. 95% of teens use the internet every day and use around seven and a half hours uh, consuming media, which would include listening to music, uh, surfing the web, going on social media, and playing video games. But, yes, when we asked the group of students, when we asked the, the pre-survey uh, for the 45 students from 32nd Street School and asked them how much time they spend online, um, what means of entertainment they use to go online, over half said they use smartphones, and only seven, which is 16%, said they use computers, while the rest said they use the combination of both. But with the increased usage of handheld devices, uh, the dy dynamics of which we used to engage this, this youth has changed. 
More than three-fourths of all teens owned cell phones, which was an increase from the 45% that, they were, that had cell phones in 2004. This raised their online um, presence for more, more than an hour and 20 minutes. So where are they going? So teens are beginning to use a variety of applications, but gravitate towards highly visual apps that provide instant sharing and gratification without much effort. While Facebook and Twitter are huge social networking sites, they are beginning to lose popularity with the younger, younger generation. Facebook and Twitter are staples of the Generation X and Baby Boomers, and teens simply don't want to hang out where their mo mothers and grandparents are sharing recipes. <laughs> so instead of um, instead, teens are using uh, websites and applications such as Instagram and Vine, where like Facebook allow you to post videos and images, but they have extra applications that let you not only edit the images but also save the images or context. Something that Facebook doesn't allow you to do. So when we conducted the survey of uh, the 45 students from 32nd Street School, we found that it correlated with the nat national average. Uh, 23 out of 45 students, which was 51%, spent one to three hours online a day, and 17 out of 45, which was 38%, spent around three to six hours. But you also have to keep in consideration that these students are in school for eight hours a day, and they don't consider the time that they spend during lunch or nutrition or switching classes checking their phone, they don't consider that as spending time online. So when we asked them how they obtain their information of politics or news or legislation, a majority said they got their information from social media, which was 75 to 76%, and the rest would get 60% from friends or television pr programs. So what's not working? Something that is really not working is having auto uh, computer generated uh, presences or having, sorry. Sorry. Uh, so having uh, these ghost accounts where accounts that aren't really <coughs> ran by people but are just from computers, these are considered to be a, not, a nuisance <coughs> and also are viewed as spam, so they're not really not engaged or go on, or they don't or students don't go on them because they don't believe that they're actually legitimate. Another thing that the focus group said was not working was the overcomplicated language of less legislation and pol and the policy. Most of them didn't understand what what these policies were doing <coughs> or they didn't know how to change it because they didn't understand them. Another thing that they found did not work at all were phone calls. <laughs> uh, one student n uh, noted that every time the phone rang and then they left the machine go on and they noticed it was a political call or someone promoting, that they would go right ahead and hang up the phone. It was something that just doesn't resonate well with youth or their parents. When they were asked if they had any, since the growing usage of apps and handheld devices, we asked them if they had any political or news apps on their phones or any of their devices. And only seven said yes. And the ones that they included were Fox News, CNN, and Facebook politics. <laughs> they, um, they really don't have a big presence in the app community. Yes. From what is working are small interactive games and prizes, which mm, it challenges the students who want to do more. Something that Project Votesmart did very well in their uh, website where they would give two options of where they, would, they saw themselves politically and then would show them a candidate that, that related to their interest. Another thing that it resonated well with youth are videos and social networking buttons. Videos are very big with with students especially, or youth, especially the YouTube videos that explain to them how things work or what's going on. It's easier to watch the news than it is to read them, and videos are a much better way to reach youth. Um, yes. 
Also, social sharing buttons are very important. You can't assume that the student or the teen will automatically share this on their own. If you make this easier for them, it would uh, spread your content more. The focus groups also noted that aesthetics are increasingly important to the websites and apps. Um, I would recommend to Naleo to use aspects such as the Yahoo News uh, front page where they could just click to the next button and it would switch through the news and not only did that catch the attention but the the titles if they had it in titles or subject matter that you know, such as subjects that were related to youth and what they were interested they were uh, swarm more to, towards those stories than anything else. Stories such as the LGBT and Chick-fil-A scandal was something that the students brought up that they found were ex was extremely important to them. And so if you focus on areas such as that, students will flock. Another thing that I thought Nadeo could use was something Amazon introduced, which was the introduction of the Mayday button, which would could be used in a ask a, ask a politician or ask someone from Naleo questions where if could not, it doesn't have to be a video chat, but it could be live chat or forums such as Reddit where you could have a page or, of questions uh, teens or students or constitu constituents ask and the answers you guys could provide so others that might have similar questions can go to the same page. And now back to Michael. We've looked at the factors that determine participation behavior in youth. We've seen how community level organizations can promote youth engagement and which organizations are succeeding at the task. We've seen how the education, we've looked at the education system and seen how public schools can promote youth participation. And we've examined the world of digital engagement that is ever more popular with youth and that might be an avenue of reaching out to them. We believe that the high school age experience exerts a significant influence on youth behavior and attitudes, and that it shapes the way that they interact with the political world when they become of voting age. Now we will discuss in more depth our policy recommendations for the Leo Educational Fund on the subject of encouraging youth participation. My recommendation is that Naleo could promote a strategy for youth that, that offers structured success and lessons in practicality. If you recall, a study showed that structured success increases youth's desire to participate. But often it does this at the expense of not affecting real change through that participation. In contrast, programs that send youth off to, con to solve root social problems tend to bring youth into contact with real world obstacles. And this frustration decreases their desire to participate. A better strategy might be one that combines the two to offer structured success, but also examine the root social problems at hand. That increases the desire to participate while offering lessons on practicality that help them take on real world challenges. This was the study's conclusion after examining both of the strategies. And the, the solution, or the, the possible solution it offered was to couple a structured success program with having youth examine the real world, the root social problems and the real world obstacles to changing um, to, to effecting change within those areas. The Naleo Educational Fund could advocate um, to other programs these best practices um, and provide information about how they can better encourage youth to participate. Um, because in Naleo, the Educational Fund's extensive reach of both national and local partners, I think they're in a really unique place to both promote the awareness of civic engagement organizations. Beginning with the new national partner, Univision, Naleo can work with them to create a short video segment that highlights a, su a successful program, uh, gives a snapshot of the experiences it provides, and even let you share their experiences on camera. For young people, hearing about an opportunity through a peer rather than an adult generally has been to be found a lot more effective. Now at a more local level, we chose to explore uh, Fathers and Families of San Joaquin as just sort of a sample, and they actually have an existing program that combines leadership training and community organization community organizing. And with these smaller organizations, Naleo can share its expertise and research on civic engagement, support it with funds, and even promote it to its contacts in the area. Now on a more um, 
partnership and program-based capacity. In terms of simply bringing students into the process, Naleo can use this relationship with school board officials to help create an arrangement in which teachers are really encouraged to actively recruit kids in these organizations. In terms of these programs, they also mainly include an element that involves interaction with local elected officials. And Naleo being what they are, they can really help foster this access and themselves also get directly involved by letting you shadow their operations, speak with employees, and give a sense of the political process from a different perspective. The policy recommendations I will leave you with today deal with improving civic engagement through the school system. Naleo, in communicating with school board officials, can discuss how to provide students with a better participatory experience while in school. Naleo can communicate with school board officials the dire need for students to understand engagement at a young age. And school board officials and teachers can improve the student body government experience so that students feel like when they engage, they can actually make a difference. This behavior will hopefully carry on into their adult lives, ensuring that the youth are willing to participate in the democratic process. Also, we found that awareness of voting registration among students was low. In an effort to mobilize the 2016 cycle of youth voters, Naleo should assess the high school population's awareness of the voting registration process. If Naleo finds that there is a substantial lack of awareness on this process, they should prioritize getting high school students information on how to register to vote. This can be done specifically in two ways. First, Naleo can speak with school board members to ensure that information about how and where to register to vote is disseminated in school, particularly in civics courses. And secondly, Naleo can appeal to state and national officials to make pre-registering to minors when they go to the DMV to get a license. While this is a controversial issue, seven states in the United States have already allowed for pre-registration for 16-year-olds, and California has garnered much support for Senate Bill 113 which would allow pre-registration for youth while obtaining driver's license at the DMVs. Overall, my policy recommendations illustrate important changes that could be addressed by the Naleo Education Fund in collaboration with their partners, such as school board members and nationally elected officials, in order to promote awareness of civic engagement among high school youth. Um, my recommendations are to make sure that the information provided to youth is not only understandable, but that the context is engaging towards youth and it provides information of the topics that interest them. Also, in terms of the digital engagement, introducing a live chat option or a forum where they could ask questions and have their answers or, and questions left on this particular page, such as Reddit, where they could go back and get information that they might need. Um, thank you for coming, and we're open for questions. Very good. Very good. So we'll go ahead and open up uh, questions for our panel. Um, <clears throat> who would like to start? Please. Sure. Um, well, first, <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking copious notes in the back. Um, but first, thank you for, for doing this. Like I said to, to you guys before, it's been a pleasure working with you. Uh, I know my colleagues have, uh, have enjoyed the experience too, and, and, and this is truly some fantastic research. Um, you know, I think that overall, I mean, there's some really solid research that went into here, and it's obviously you translated it very well into some very good um, recommendations. And funnily enough, some of them are already kind of underway. Um, we didn't bring them up, but they actually are underway in terms of pre-registration, like you said, you referenced the, the bill that's currently um, in the State House. Um, in the capital, rather. Um, but I think one of the recommendations that I would have had, I think, um, Michael, you prevent, provided some really good um, um, insights, but I think some more tangible <clears throat> examples of, uh, particularly when you're talking about the structured program versus um, solving problems, um, it was very cerebral, so I had a hard time kind of picturing how that would translate into action. I'm not the, the brightest spark out there, so I need to, I need very, uh, I need it spelled out for me. But, I can it. Okay, excellent. Yeah, no, that would be so wonderful. If you I basically took that recommendation from a study, uh -huh. um, and I, I didn't look too much at what Nalea was already doing, but mm -hmm. the way we could translate it is, the study was looking at two different high schools. One offered programs that sent youth to do, they call it structured success, where you do some kind of participation, and you have a tangible, get something done um, outlook. The other one, they sent youth off to basically 
make up their own um, path to changing something. So the first one was more like volunteering, trash picking up, stuff like that. So there was a tangible effect, but it didn't really do anything. The benefit is that youth want to do more of it because they see that there's effect. And then the other program basically sent youth out to like advocate political um, issues and, and contact local officials and things like that. And obviously that led to more failure and obstacles because it's the real world. And the problem with this is even though they're addressing real problems, it discourages them because of the failure. And the, the possible solution was to do the structured success Maybe not trash picking up, but we have a program called the Joint Educational Program, mm -hmm. which sends you to uh, a local school for a semester um, or for a couple months. And you either are a teaching assistant or run your own mini course. Um, so the tangible success is that at the end of the program, you're, you've completed something. You've done a course. You get hugs from kids. Um, <laughs> it doesn't really affect fundamental change. But if you couple that with maybe forcing them to research education reform mm -hmm. or um, or, or interviewing teachers about what it's like to teach and, and possibilities for change that might have more efficacy. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just about getting them to do something, it's about getting them to make change. Mm -hmm. That's great, Jay, you some great example. Yeah. Thank you, there we go. Awesome. Other thoughts, questions? Yes. Sure, so um, for some people, their favorite part of voting is getting that little I voted sticker. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it really all comes down to. <laughs> <laughs> and so, because Michael mentioned that it's not that efficacy is a huge part, but I also think knowing that other people are doing it is huge. So are there ways to install other uh, sort of time periods where like, you get a, like I registered, I don't really know. Um, for example, when I just got my license uh, renewed, they asked me, do you want to register to vote? So if I say no, five years from now, I'm going to go back and ask me again, did you register to vote? So what sort of repetitive ways that apply to kids, even digitally, how can you have that there are more, <clears throat> sort of more opportunities to, even just to ask, did you vote? It doesn't have to be like you're accountable for it, but just you instill accountability because it's being asked, if that makes sense. Reese, that might be more your sort of world of digital <clears throat> sort of engagement. I'm thinking more. So okay. But, or so. <laughs> but well, I was doing some research into how big Reddit got. Um, Reddit started off with just, I think, $500 in promotion, like, as a budget for promotions, and all they bought was stickers. They had the little sticker logo, and all they did was just post stickers everywhere they could. Now, I'm not saying the Leo could start making Reddit stickers, but if they had something that re that had an image or a message or a slogan that they could start not only just putting them on, on walls or on subways or just having a message online, because I know that my parents have heard a lot about Naleo through um, like Univision, a Spanish news um, broadcast, but I haven't really heard anything from you. So if we do the effort as we're doing to the parents towards the youth, the same effort, I think we could like resonate in a message that would want them to engage more in politics. Great. Sure. Um, piggybacking off what you just said about uh, students finding out the information from their parents um, and getting it from the uh, For your focus group, for the Latino students that you questioned, primarily first generation American, second generation American, what was their um, kind of demographics? Um, I don't know if you captured that, but. We didn't think it was gonna be, it was an important question to ask, but we didn't know quite how to ask it. So one of the ways we kind of went about this was, um, we didn't go deeply into analyzing this data, but we asked if students, if their parents were registered to vote. And we thought that would maybe allude to whether or not their citizens, or the, their parents were citizens. <coughs> we didn't go into that kind of, re into that anal analysis of the, that data, but uh, Michael did show a little bit about, you know, if your parents are registered to vote, maybe they could be already engaged in the civic participation process. And, and it, that would make a, a more, <coughs> give you more of a push as a youth or as a child to get involved as well. So we definitely didn't ask those students. They were they were young. We had to have consent waivers to even speak to them. So we didn't get that information from them if they were first or second generation. But it would definitely be a, an important project to look into into the future. And we were actually thinking um, if we had the time, we would have loved to do a second focus group 
with uh, speaking with the students that were really engaged in speaking to us during that focus group. So there was like six or seven students from each of our groups that were really engaged and it would have been really influential to get their input and maybe know a little bit more about their demographics. A quick follow up to that, and I'm sorry if I'm putting you on the spot for this, um, but you know, a lot of research, uh, media research outlets, uh, surveys that have been taken indicate that uh, further into generations of you know, uh, Latino uh, American second, third generation don't typically watch uh, Spanish speaking programming. And I'm curious to see if you think it is a better strategy to find an additional media partner, or if you think that due to uh, what other research was found in this survey, if it's worth mobilizing them through social media and for go attempting an English speaking partner. So I'm just curious what your recommendations would be based off the, the focus group data. So when we asked the students where they were getting their information, of course most of them said their peers and their families. When we asked them if they saw any any news, we asked them if they saw like shows such as the Colbert Report or the Daily Show, and only about four students say, said they did, but then you also have to consider they're under 18, so their parents wouldn't, if, if their parents were really involved, they wouldn't even allow them to stay up that late. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, sorry, the question. I definitely think that the making the transition between whether you're gonna promote this this information in English or in Spanish is something that research needs to be done on. And I remember speaking with Ronnie a little bit about um, there's gonna be a new partner for Univision that's gonna be just in English. So that's kind of interesting and I've been watching, I've been listening to a radio station that's in Spanglish. So I thought that that would even be a, a more influential. <laughs> and I might need a, an accurate definition of Spanglish. <laughs> it's just like they transition back and forth okay. and it's so interesting. That's what I thought. That's just <laughs> checking. Yeah. So that could even be like a way to promote uh, the youth. I know that I'm super interested in, in that kind of language. I guess it's not really language yet, but you know, that would be a step in the future that they could take. Dan. Or if we have time, I have two questions, if not, I have one. So you uh, we have time. Okay. Um, and as near as I can tell, guys, uh, there's not a lot of research on either of these topics. So what I'm really interested in is not so much you telling us what you found, but what your opinions are based on what you've learned over the course of the semester. Question number one, what I was really, really struck with right off the bat, is the tremendous influence of education and parental involvement and political participation. And what strikes me is in the area of K-12 education, you guys have probably read something about this, but California has finally decided years and years late is that if you want to raise overall student performance, there are certain at-risk groups that require a disproportionate amount of attention and support and resources. So I guess my question to you is, if you're looking to increase youth voter engagement and civic participation, should the lion's share of your efforts be on particular underserved communities, or is it something more effectively done in a, in a more universal way? What do you think? There's, I read some articles on, they call them non-college bound youth. So it's either youth in, I guess the political definition is youth of 18 to 29, but I think they were also including high school students who didn't plan to go to college, and people in the workforce <coughs> who didn't plan to do any college um, before they were 30. And they lag far behind the youth overall. So it's not that addressing the youth problem is addressing youth as a group. It, it is divided along, along lines of inequality. Um, and I, I don't have an answer for your question because there's kind of a trade-off between focusing your efforts on engaging those who are most disadvantaged or expanding upon reaching those kids who are already being addressed. And it might, because programs have limited funds and time, it might be the latter. I, I really don't have an answer for it. I think just as a follow-up, some of my research found that actually it's these organizations that um, can correct for the social background. A study found that actually social background didn't um, contribute too much to whether youth in these organizations were more likely to vote, that that was actually a neg negligible factor. Um, in whether or not these organizations engaged youth. But I think the biggest part is then, how did they get involved in these opportunities in the first place? Um, how did they get a bigger awareness out there? So I think, to answer your question, I think oh, the awareness is like the first start of it, and then programs that are accessible to all will be like the next step in that process. Which, well, Adrian, is a perfect segue to my second question. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
each one of these, <coughs> one of them in a slightly different way, addresses to me what I, I think is a fundamental uh, uh, challenge here. And that is what I call a big fish, small pond, small fish, big pond question. Whether it's civics classes, whether it's student government, whether it's community organizations, just what you all said, is when you keep a young person in a smaller pond and let them succeed in that smaller pond, that empowers them, that's terrific. And then the trick is how do you get them to shift into a bigger pond where they might not have quite as much influence right away. So I've got a question for you, and it comes at it from a, the, the opposite perspective. Not instead of, but in addition to encouraging young people to go from the small to the big pond, is there something that can be done to encourage political and community leaders to help bridge the gap? In other words, you talked about volunteer activities, for example. You, know, you volunteer, uh, you were talking about Michael, you volunteer in school. And as you were talking about, you're talking about student government. Is there anything to be done in the area of, uh, of asking, is there anything that you can accomplish, do you guys think, just an opinion, and asking elected officials and their advisors to come to these civic and these educational in these school-based activities and provide the bridge in the other direction. I'm not sure I'm making a lot of sense. The top-down direction. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, when I interned with Assembly Member Ricardo Lara, he was starting a program start, um, called the Young Senators Program, and where they would uh, gather a certain amount of students of, per school, um, and then in the weekends they would have a, an extra day of class. And in this, in this ex extra day of class, they, start, they taught various things from uh, environment to economics to po political issues. And eventually, at the end of, I think, of a year from this program, they would go to the Capitol. And then in the Capitol, they would present something, or they would receive a, a, a certificate for participation. And this was all in the works while I was there. I don't know if he actually completed it, but if if Senators or assembly, member pro um, assembly members provide programs that give students uh, scholarships for college or, or just something that might end up helping their resumes to go into college, which would probably want make students want to participate as much as they could. And, and Donna Reese, the other thing that I interpret from what you're saying is a young person on his or her own probably can't make that much of a difference in the big pond. But if one of the big fish helps them, yeah. then maybe they can. Sure. Other uh, questions, comments? Yeah, Clay. Because I, um, I know in the work that we do at Nandel, it's not only about being able to address the structural barriers that prevent participation, but how do we encourage that participation and in incentivizing kind of the personal investments that people have in civic participation? So I'm curious in terms of. Um, in this discussions we've had with the focus group participants, what was your sense of the personal kind of motivators of students to be actively involved? Because I think part of the balance and the struggle for us is, you know, you want to be able to incite people to act, but then you want them to also have that personal ownership over the action that they're taking as well, so that you're not walking somebody along to the polling place and going home, but you're encouraging that political participation. I think. Uh the situation we had in our focus group was really unique in that the students were pretty involved and they were really interested in politics, but um, they lacked those structures. So these students that we spoke to, 20% of them were in official positions in their student body government. They were ready to learn about Yahoo News and um, they were actually involved in a lot of outside clubs that either were about uh, animal rights um, or even sports clubs. So they were really involved. and. In terms of making those those the initial um, wantings to go into politics or understanding what they can do at the local level, I think translating that into being incentivized to do it is something that we should we should really look into because I think that these students wanted to and but they didn't have the ability to. And also the focus on the uh, programs or the information you want to provide, such as. Uh, the LGBT community, the um, the feminist or the women's rights community, and anything that they feel that is in the 
like in the federal forum right now or that are being challenged like women's right and birth control and LGBT, any of those big topics are also very important to them and if you just associate them in a way that they see fits them or they see it's hurting them or they can make a difference, I feel that they would flock towards trying to make sure that they maintain their rights or maintain what they currently have right now or improving it. So I actually have a question. So I have a 16 year old nephew and trying to call him on the phone is pretty much a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> the only way I seem to get a hold of him is by sending him a text and sometimes I get a response. So I'm just curious since this didn't come up during your presentation, how could text messaging be utilized for pre registrants I definitely think that since we've transitioned now, some states have actually gone into like online registration. Text messaging could be the next next way to do that. Um, I'm not sure if um, you could Naleo could partner with other people who like get out get out the vote and other organizations that work to, to mobilize youth in in using text messaging to to get out that message. But it's definitely an important way. And since most of this, I, I mentioned that schools should be the ones disseminating the information. Well, now that you do mention this, it would be a smart, since most of the kids are on their, their phones anyways during school, to send them text messages to mobilize them to vote. So that's, I think, a really important, really important aspect. What you could also, like, the text message, the content of it could be a link, a web link to something that is, a website that is for the phone, because it's going to be on the phone. Um, that, I think that would make the process a little more streamlined. Great, I think we have time for one more question. Or maybe two. We'll, we'll jump up there. Yeah, look, um, so we talked a little bit about making uh, how the technology that engages students gets them going, you know, on Twitter, sharing things. One thing that seems to really get students going are online games. Is there any way that we can incorporate that aspect into, you know, engaging students? Have you done any research on whether that exists? Or uh, there's angry, been... angry political birds? <laughs> 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 they want to engage those students but I don't there's not much uh, research that they've been like that's been done and I don't I can't really say that anything is working but if they provide uh, something like what uh, Project Boatsmart did in providing uh, it, it's not a, a game but it's picking one side or picking the other it makes them feel like oh my side is gonna win so I'm gonna pick or, or um, I know I'm this type of person, so I'm just gonna make take this test to make sure I am. Or oh, I'm taking this test and I'm, I thought I was Republican and I'm a liberal. So it's yeah, little it little things like that are something that might uh, spark the interest of gamers. Haven't you had that last? Question? Actually, you just addressed my question, which is you know how do we actually connect with folks? Because half of the challenge that we have is. Know, what is the best vehicle? Like, how do we get them to, to if we do produce a video uh, aimed at youth with Univision, like, how do we get them to watch it? We've actually done that before, but we just couldn't get anyone to actually <laughs> click it and open it. Um, so that's actually really useful in terms of, of giving some insight as to what are the ways that we can get people to click on that link or, or whatever, because too often the challenge that we have is a self-selected audience. The people who are interested in going to a political website or a Facebook page or whatever are already going to vote. Uh, so that's really helpful. Very good. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you all very much. I know Dan has a few closing remarks, and then we can uh, call it a day. Thank you again. <laughs> well, I want to. I just want to take a minute before we uh, wrap up the semester uh, to thank a few people and to provide a little bit of information that hopefully will be helpful both to our students and to our guests. Um, First and most importantly, uh, as we've done throughout the morning, I want to thank our community partners. And I will tell, I will tell you, uh, all of you from Naleo, that what we've heard all semester long from our students is just how tremendously helpful you have been to them in their work on this, on this project. Um, when Ronnie and I first talked about this, I think there were times in that initial conversation when we both had some doubt could actually pull it off. But not only has it succeeded, but I think beyond either of our wildest expectations, 
And while I'm certainly in a minute going to let the students know how impressed I am, and what we are all about, about what they've done, I want to start out by thanking all of you from the LEO for the time and the effort and the commitment you've given to this project. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, second, uh, for the benefit of both the students and our guests, um, I want to tell you that this is a program that is still in its relative infancy. We've only been running a research-based internship, internship for a couple of years now. And I think this uh, semester has by far been its most successful, not just for this last group, but for all, all three of our research teams. And I want to take a minute to make sure that not only Art, but in particular, Laura Hill and Jody Epstein get the credit they deserve for the time they put in their <laughs> And for the students, again, not just the Leo, the Leo team, but I know there's representatives from the other two groups here as well. You guys are phenomenal. I've got to tell you, these are the three most challenging topics we've taken on since we've begun this research internship. And we had real concerns. I remember sitting with Jody and Laura late last, uh, uh, late summer, and saying, are we going to be throwing too much at these guys? And we didn't think so, but we crossed our fingers and hoped for the best. <laughs> <laughs> and watching the run-throughs this week that you did, and watching the fine-tuning you did to present today, was absolutely phenomenal. I can't tell you how impressed we are and how proud we are of all of you for the work that you've done, not just what we've learned for yourselves, but the real-world contributions you've made to some of society's most significant challenges. And for that, give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> The, uh, the research-based internship, as I know some of the students know, um, is something that was suggested to us a few years ago. Uh, a small group of USC trustees came to, our, came to President Nikias shortly after he became USC's president, and they said, we have an idea for you. And one of the things you learn very quickly about university politics is when trustees have an idea, you listen. <laughs> <laughs> and this idea actually turned out to be a really phenomenal one. And if you have any parents on the trustees, all their ideas are phenomenal, but this one in particular. Um, what they said, what, the, what, what these trustees said to President Nikias and to Provost Garrett and later, and later to us, is they said, we believe that USC students, we believe that USC undergrads, with an occasional graduate student to help, we believe that USC undergrads that really smart and committed and determined 19 and 20 and 21 year olds can take on some of California's most intractable problems and come up with answers, and come up with recommendations, and come up with potential solutions. And they said, well, give them, give them the tools, give them the guidance, give them the direction, and we think this can be done. Now figure out how to do it. And we sat down and put together this program with the idea that with that kind of guidance, with that kind of support, that our smartest, our most impressive USC students could in fact put together a set of recommendations that would be of real practical use to people who are out in the community every day fighting these fights and, and trying to take on these challenges. And what we really strived for was to give you guys not just the personal rewarding academic experience that comes from a directed research or an independent study project, but that same personal benefit for you coupled with the real potential societal benefit as well. And I don't think we realized at the time when those trustees first came to us what an ambitious idea this was. And over the few semesters of this project, we've taken on challenges in the area of economic growth and job creation, of environmental protection and energy exploration, K through 12 and higher education, healthcare, public safety, any range, uh, range of any number of issues. And the one that never came up, not from the trustees, not from President Nikias, not from Provost Garrett, not from any of us until this semester, was we're so focused on public policy challenges that a community or state faces, it didn't occur to us to assign a team to take on a, 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 an even more important underlying challenge, which is that a community in which its citizens are not engaged can't solve problems of public education, can't solve problems of job creation and economic growth, can't solve problems of environmental protection. You can't because if the people don't care, if the people aren't involved, you can't get it done. Some of you have heard me say, I like to say that politics is too important to be left to the politicians. <laughs> and you leave it just to those people who seek out office to solve these problems, very little is going to happen. And so what I was so, so struck by when Ronnie and her colleagues came to us with this idea 
is it really did address a much more fundamental challenge in society. How do you get Californians, particularly young Californians, to care enough, to get involved enough to lay the groundwork so we can take on these other policy challenges? And don't get me wrong, because the education team, you guys did a phenomenal job. The energy and the environment group, I still can't believe how much information you guys processed over the course of this year. Um, but this last group um, took on an issue that's a real personal import to me. How do you take a generation whose members volunteer in greater numbers than any other generation in America today or in recent American history, but vote in smaller numbers than any other generation, and convince them that volunteering is phenomenal, that volunteering is admirable, that volunteering is noble, but that it's not enough, and that you can only clean up so many parks, that you can only teach so many at-risk kids to read, and you can only bring so many meals to so many seniors who can't get around anymore. Not that those aren't commendable things to do, but they're not enough. And how do you take those young people who have all that energy and all that enthusiasm and not move it <coughs> from one sector to the other, but expand it? And I think what, what we heard you guys present today is something that I think lays the groundwork for some really, really important work. Not just here at USC, not just with Naleo, but more broadly throughout this community and throughout the state. And I think the work that was done on education, the work that was done on energy environment, once again, you guys are going to get academic credit for this. You're going to get really good grades. Well, most of you, right? Aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> for the work that you did. But on the off chance that there's anything more important than in the world than a good grade at the end of the semester, <laughs> people can disagree on that. You made a real difference. You made a real difference, and you gave people who take on these problems every day the wherewithal to take them on that much more effectively. The late Steve Jobs had a quote that I share in my leadership class with the students who take it. He used to talk about the importance of putting a dent in the universe. And I love that quote. The reason I love that quote is because it's manageable. You probably hear a lot about changing the world. You know what? Changing the world is hard. Changing the world is complicated. Changing the world can be a little bit overwhelming. But what Jobs was talking about is not changing the world, but putting a dent in the universe. Finding one particular place in the universe where you think you can make a difference. difference. And what our greatest hope is, Arts and Jodies and Laura's and Jenna's and Kirsten's and Luca's and mine, is that a few years from now, two years from now, four years from now, six years from now, that you come back into this room at USC or a room like it and listen to a group of USC undergrads from the class of 2017, 2019, 2021 presenting to you to help you take on the real world challenges that you've decided to take on after USC. So thanks again to all our community partners, particularly the people at Naleo. Thanks in, uh, to all of uh, the people at the Underwood Institute who worked so hard this semester, particularly Jody and Laura. But most importantly, thanks to you guys, the students in Poly South 395, because you proved us right. You give USC students the right kind of crowbars, and they can put a huge dent in the universe. Nice job.